Chris Teen White from Diversity Mark, talking about the benefits of diverse and inclusive workplaces. Ladies and gentlemen, it's over to Christine. So first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, it's great to be invited. Um, so as you mentioned, Dr. my name is Christine White. Um, I've been on the diversity and inclusion journey now for the last three years as head of Diversity Mark. So I'm going to summarize. I have to watch the time because I'm a talker. So I'll summarize within the next 15 minutes. Um, really just an introduction into this um, and some of the benefits really um, into diverse and inclusive workplaces. So first of all, um, what is diversity? Um, well, diversity in the workplace means um, that there are array of different people within an organization um, and employees. Now it goes beyond someone's gender. Um, it's not just thinking about men and women and um, it goes beyond that really and um, takes into account different thinking styles and um, can involve different people of different ages, um, ethnicity, personal background, sexual identity, education and so on. So um, really over the last um, few decades really, um, increase in diversity within various business industries has become um, really more common. Um, so a truly diverse organisation really will have an employee base representative of our wider society. So. It's really about having people from different backgrounds and um, it gives organizations diversity of thought and um, lots of different thinking styles within organizations and that's really the key benefit and we'll talk about that soon. So inclusion, inclusion is really it's almost like having the jigsaw pieces there but then making them work together. So inclusion is really where people's differences are seen as an advantage um, and valued um, and able to really um, there to help everyone thrive together. An inclusive workplace will have fair policies and practices and, and a culture where everyone sort of feels that they belong in an organization and they can work together effectively and their voice is heard. So that's just a little snippet of an introduction. So um, just move on to the next slide. So <clears throat> I'll just talk just very briefly about my journey. So before we talk more about the benefits. So um, my career, um, journey started out when I was um, 18, um, just literally turned 18. I got a job in, I'm not sure if you remember the Lions and Leicester um, branch or the Lions and Leicester Bank. Um, they were um, amalgamated or they were acquired by Santander. So they're Santander now. Um, so they are, I was there really um, within the next 10 years after starting as a cashier. Um, I realized that I sort of flair for sales and people management. So I completed all the sort of relevant financial exams and everything and worked my way up through the various roles um, within the branch network and traveled all around Northern Ireland in different branches. Um, about 10 years later after starting, I ended up back um, running the branch that I started at um, when I was 18, um, handed the keys and it was the flagship branch of Northern Ireland. So that was a great, great um, experience for me. So just turned 30 at the age, at, at, in 2010, I thought, well, I've been in this um, company now for 13 years, it's time for a change. So, um, I decided that I would go into a completely different sector and um, had a sort of passion for, cost, for people and customer satisfaction. So I applied for a job as customer service manager in the Agni Group. So they're obviously probably familiar with them. They're a very prestigious motor group in Northern Ireland here and a great organization. So um, 40, 41 people applied and three interviews later, I was offered the job. Um, but I didn't realize anything, I didn't think anything of it um, in that um, it was actually quite rare for them to, well, it was completely rare for them to employ a, a female into that role. Quite often it would have attracted men, women wouldn't have applied. Um, they just changed the title slightly because they thought they needed to think differently about this role. So it did attract more women and to apply for it. So um, what I didn't realize, I was actually the first female in, in, in the history of the group to actually go into that after sales management role. Um, and I was quite often the only woman around the table, <laughs> well, quite, most of the time. Um, so I didn't let that put me off. There were definitely a few people, old timers, that rolled their eyes when I started and thought this will never work. <laughs> I didn't know anything about cars or um, anything. But for me, it's it's not about the product; it's about people. Um, so, so it was it was um, a, a journey. Within a few months, um, we increased customer satisfaction scores to within the top ten percent of the UK. Um, and that was all with the same, same people, you know, the same team, no turnover. And um, we developed some really um, sort of new front of house concepts that were actually rolled out to the UK. So we, our branch or our sort of um, where we were at was seen as an example of, of where people would come in and look and see what we were doing. 
So, I mean, what was it all about? Um, back then, I didn't know anything about diversity and inclusion. <laughs> I was just I went into a role that I enjoyed and made something of it. But, um, you know, looking back now, retrospectively, um, you know, it's diversity of thought. It was somebody completely different coming in with a different thinking style into a role um, that looked at things with through a different set of eyes. Uh, I think that really that's what it was. And it was also um, having a female there in, in what was a very male dominated environment to, to, to represent 50% of the population and think about what it would be like for a female coming in. So um, I could talk about it all day, but that's just the summary. <laughs> so, um, so then um, the next stage really on my journey before moving into diversity was um, I met my husband, Johnny, in 2012. We were married in 2015 and had our boy, our lovely uh, boy, Ethan, in 2016. I have another wee one on the way as well, a couple of months. So um, so over the years, my hobby, Johnny, really helped me to see things differently. Um, he's a scientist, he does an, a very important job, but he doesn't take work home with him. Like He doesn't take stresses or anything home. He's a great work-life balance and um, works flexibly. He's always done. Um, it's really important to him. Um, he leaves work every day at four o'clock. He's home in the house for half four. So um, I was the opposite. I was a real workaholic and um, was very much ambitious. And I was going to be at the top of you know the group and everything else in my head. And but um, so he couldn't understand me when we got together. We moved in together for the first time. Couldn't understand my values and just I was burnt out all the time and stressed out and coming in late and in from work very early as well. So I suppose just a wee lesson that I learned from being with somebody different that had different values from me was that. Um, you know, he, it was all about, for me, titles and salary. My health was suffering. I had health problems that I didn't actually link up with the fact that it was my lifestyle. I had operations and everything, and I was burnt out. Um, so I decided that after, after we had Ethan, I became a mum. We also lost my stepdad within a few months of having Ethan. So it was a life-changing time, really. Um, caused me to reevaluate my life, and I decided that I wanted to go on a mission <laughs> Um, to have a, a new life, a new job as well with purpose. Um, so I decided to leave the big corporate environment. Um, although I did learn so much when I was there and worked for great organizations, I decided it was time for a change. Um, so I started looking for jobs in the charitable sector and third sector, because um, I really wanted to improve my health and well-being. I realized that there was a link between the two, between the burnout and the and the health side of things and well-being. So that then led to the next chapter, um, which is what we're going to talk about today. So diversity, Mark, um, <clears throat> we're, we are a, a charitable organisation. Uh, we were founded um, by women in business. I'm not sure if you're familiar with women in business, but they're, they're an amazing organisation. Um, back in 2016, uh, we were launched in 2017. So it'll be four years in September this year. So we're just under four years old. We were launched with nine organizations um, signed up on board with us. Um, so the bottom line is what we do is we award um, an accreditation, which is called the diversity mark. So it's a bit like investors and people, but for diversity and inclusion and a lot more straightforward than investors and people. Um, so uh, we refer to it as the mark of progress. You may have seen it in some of the business magazines and things. Do you have the mark of progress? That's what we refer to it as. Um, the mark of a progressive company. So if we fast forward on now four years after launch, um, I'm delighted that we're now working with 90, over 90 organizations now um, in the UK and Ireland. We started out in Northern Ireland. So a lot of the organizations we have are on our Northern Ireland base, but we're now in that over the last year, we've expanded out into the UK and Ireland, uh, which, is, which is great. So the organizations we have on board are all different sizes from all sectors. Um, I think our smallest organization have about 20 employees and our largest have 23,000. So some organizations join us to help them get started really with this because it's something they think this is something we really need to do. Um, and the starting point um, is usually around them understanding their, their, da their data within their organization. They go into listening mode with their employees um, and underrepresented groups and they identify any barriers and they put together an action plan and a strategy to affect change. Um, Others organizations that join us are well on their way with this um, and their, their sort of plans will be will be more advanced than the organizations at the start of the journey. So the start point is very different for every organization, but the, the ultimate goal is really all about culture change and shift to really create this culture where everyone feels that they belong in an organization and they can contribute and 
you know, that they are appreciated and valued. Um, so that's really the, the ultimate goal. So I'll just move to the next slide. Um, so the bottom line is that, um, you know, we all know, we probably all know that in relation to equality and everything else, this is really morally and ethically the right thing to do, but it's big time the smart thing to do. Um, so the business case for diversity has been is very clear. Um, the bottom line is that if your organization is diverse, no matter what size it is, whether it's 10 employees or 50,000 employees, the more diversity there, the better the performance, the higher the employee satisfaction, better financial returns and innovation increases as well. So really the bottom line is that when an organization, an organization will thrive when the employees are thriving. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on the benefits. Um, so McKinsey and company are one of the leading sort of um, researcher within this field and they're very widely quoted. So they really find that gender diversity in an organization is a key to financial success. Um, now they did delve into the leadership composition of over 1,000 companies in 15 countries. It's very extensive research. Um, so one of the stats they found was that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity on their senior teams, where a lot of the decisions are made in companies, um, they're 25% more likely to have above average profitability. Um, the Australian government in 2020 produced real groundbreaking research um, that I wasn't even aware they were doing. They, um, in partnership with the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, um, studied 11,000 organisations over six years. Um, so it's sort of the most electrifying research that's come out as to date. Um, so there's lots of stats in there, and they know they also know that this is a key to building their economy. Um, so, for example, just one of the stats for every 10% increase in females in management and um, personnel that led to a 5.8% increased chance of outperforming in the sector. So um, Glassdoor found that um, diversity and inclusion is really, really important when you're thinking about attracting talent to, to within your organization. Two thirds of job hunters indicated that diversity is an important factor when evaluating companies to work for and job offers. Um, and employee satisfaction, you know, um, if you get this right and go on a journey with this, it really will reduce any conflict in groups. Um, it will en en enable people to work together better and collaborate and improve loyalty. Um, innovation, Deloitte found that this innovation increases by 83% when employees feel really um, that their organization is committed to this. It's not just about checking boxes or paying lip service. It's really very important to the organization and they feel included and empowered to use their voice. <clears throat> Global image, you know, it's, it's thinking about your brand as well. You know, it's really, really important now to, to think about your reputation and your values. And that goes not even just with your employees, but right out into the wider community. And um, potentially if you have a slight supply chain and your local communities and society as well. And then we've got economic growth. Um, PwC, a couple of months ago there, produced a report. Northern Ireland's economy could benefit from as much as 2.3 billion if the number of women in the workforce was increased to the same level as the UK's top performing region. And Harvard last year um, produced a report that if we take action now to advance gender equality, that could add 13 trillion to the, the gross domestic product by 2030. So, I mean, there's countless global academic studies and economies now, our governments are now beginning to realize this is really important if they're wanting to, to have a strategy to, to grow their economy and strengthen it. So it's, it's go gone beyond being sort of like a, a woman's issue or an issue about equality. It's very much obviously that, but it's equality, but it's very much a business issue now. Um, so let's see now, move on to the next slide. So the business case for diversity, just again, I quite like this. This was a slide I used in another presentation, so I thought I'd pop it in there. It's quite a good one because it's visual. I'm a very visual person. So it is said, now I don't know whether this is true or not, but it's estimated that women um, make about 85% of spending decisions in households. Now, I don't know if you agree with that or not, um, but I think we are quite influential in our own way. But women do remain underrepresented at decision-making levels in many organisations. Um, and there are still lots of um, all-male boards and executive teams, or maybe a token woman quite often, you know, for example, the HR person the HR director could be the, 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 the female around the table. So they do say that 30% is the tipping point. You know, if you've got um, somebody that's underrepresented, once they get over 30%, that's the tipping point of where they're, they're actually, their voice is more powerful and their, their ideas are heard as opposed to being the, the minority. 
Um, so I thought that little cartoon is quite funny there. Now, some organizations that we have on board are the other way around, the, the more females than males, and they're working on the, the other way around. So it's not about women, it's about the balance, really, the balance for better. So <clears throat> let's see. So just Generation Z, um, it's just important to think about the next generation. They're between the age of 11 and 26. So these young people are entering our world of work, and a lot of them have been there for a few years already. Um, and a lot of sort of time has been spent into studying this next cohort of, of young people. And they're very, very much um, price, uh, purpose driven, um, and globally minded, and they care very much about equality and diversity. So it's thinking about that next generation and how to engage them and retain them. Um, you know, so we're not all, we're, we're all fighting over the same talent quite often in different sectors. So it's thinking differently. How can we actually think differently, attract more diverse people and retain the young people and really um, make them feel valued? So let's see. So I'll just quickly touch on the accreditations that we have at Diversity Mark. Everybody that joins us starts out with bronze and that's all around gender. It's a really good place to start is with gender. So it's looking at the, the, the gender balance within the organization at different levels. Um, so organizations submit three targets to us after analyzing their data and we help them with that. And the, the, the bronze Diversity Mark is a very good standard and most of our organizations are on bronze. We have four out of the 90 at silver level. So it shows you that it's a very high standard. Silver is around, um, it's maybe two or three years down the line on the journey or longer for some. Um, and it goes beyond just gender to bring in two wider areas of diversity, such as LGBTQ and race and ethnicity. The, the organizations decide at that stage which two areas to bring into their plan of action. Um, gold is down the line um, we're not at that stage yet because we are a young organization but that will be for organizations that are really a shining example in their sector and their wider community and there'll be internal audits and everything at that stage so um, we have an independent panel of experts that actually carry out our independent assessments of the organizations um, they're, they're where we don't influence them at all they're completely independent this is a very very robust and, and rigorous um, uh, award that, that organizations get the accreditation. Um, so you can see there, there may be a couple of familiar faces on the slide, but there's a good representation there from, um, you know, very highly respected business experts, and they really do bring a high standard to the accreditation and the assessment process. And they've all got different areas of expertise as well, which is great. So um, Organizations that join us, just conscious of time, I, I know I'm a talker, so I think I've gone up to about 17 minutes now. So, um, so organizations that join us, um, they will um, be able to use the mark. Once they get their accreditation, they can really use the diversity mark um, really to raise their profile as an inclusive employer to help attract and retain talent. Um, they benefit from expert uh, feedback every year on the journey with us. And if it was me in an organization starting out with this or you know, at any stage, I would really value that feedback. I would need that every year to guide me and keep me on track. Um, they open up a network of contacts to help them on the journey. We have individual bodies that, that work with um, individuals from organizations that join us on this journey. Um, we have quarterly roundtables for our organizations, um, which are really, really valuable. And we get great feedback on the roundtables and with different topics for those based on what our organizations want us to cover. So it's all about talking about challenges and learning and sharing best practice. We have a global resource pool that we share as well with our organizations um, with, with lots of guidance in there to help on the journey. So um, I think the last thing is just, it's just a wee video, which I'll hopefully I'll play here. Let's see. <coughs> just some feedback really from some of our heads of organizations on board. So that's Sarah Benning from NI Water. Um, Catalyst Chief Executive, again, very proud of, of having been on the journey with us. Um, John French is a huge advocate for this. He tells everybody about it, um, that it transformed his organization. He didn't expect it to. And Danske Bank would say it's instrumental in enabling them to, to grow and expand across all facets of their business. So, so that's kind of the end now um, of the presentation. Um, it's just important to emphasize as well that it's not just the big organizations. We're encouraging the smaller organizations. We even have two primary schools on board. So you can, there's a good diversity there in our, on our range of organizations. So hopefully that has given you a little summary. I've tried to summarize it all um, there in, in the time that I had. Indeed, thanks very much for that. Has anybody got any questions for Christine? There's Lynn. Lynn. Hi, hi, Christine. I'm hi, Lynn. Lynn. 
Um, I'm an HR consultant, so I've uh, 30 years mm -hmm. HR experience, and I did, I worked for Diageo for 20 years. Oh, so Diageo would be seen as one of the world leaders. Definitely. I know they're not on your list, but I'm guessing it's because they, they, they act as a global company, so they'll have global sort of diversity. Yeah, they're on our list, not signed up yet, but they're on, okay, on our right. list, we're hoping to get them soon. Very good. But I know a good bit about them, and we had... Um, we had oh what's his name? We had one of the speakers, which one of their chairs over at an event that we had, a summit we had, yeah. and he yeah. was amazing. You know, talking yeah. about Diageo. Yeah. So yeah, hoping they're, to get them. gone a long way. So mm -hmm. and I, and I can see having worked for a company like Diageo, I can see the absolute benefits. You know, they're they're an alcohol company. Their their biggest concern is that alcohol goes the same way as smoking, so that they want to be seen as a highly respected company. Um, mm -hmm. etc. So they've got a very, very clear business rationale. For a smaller company in, mm -hmm. in the likes of Northern Ireland, it probably feels more difficult to see that real business benefit. What, mm -hmm. what do you see as, um, you know, for a smaller company, maybe only with 10, 20 employees, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's the big benefit for them in terms of yeah. signing up for you? Yeah, well, um, I mean, as I said, we've companies on, on board from all, all sizes, you know, um, we do have some of the smaller organisations. Yeah. It can be, sometimes it can be more difficult for the larger organisations because yeah. they have so yeah. many mindsets yeah. to actually, you know, to, to try and sell it to so many people, especially in an established organisation where there's already a culture there. So it can be more difficult for the large organisations, especially when they don't have that culture there already. And it can take years, even for a slight shift to happen. So we would often say the smaller organisations, it's much easier to get people on board and really involved. Um, the targets and everything would be very different for a small organisation, yeah. um, you know, in relation to, and it would be, it's, it's much easier when you're a small organisation to listen to your employees because it's yeah. a small group of people and they can all be involved in the journey. So, um, and as well as that, if a small organisation have growth plans, it's the ideal time to do it is there at that stage and actually get the culture right at the start before the growth happens. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the benefits really are not really that much different in relation yeah. to, um, you know, you can have a small organization and the culture could be all wrong. Not that I'm saying the culture would be, yeah. but um, it's about making people feel really valued and listen. you want to listen to them. You want to find out what they want and you want to bring them on the journey with you. And then if you do have any vacancies, it's about being really as an attractive employer and bringing the best people in to work in your organization. Because if you're a small organization and you have one person that maybe isn't performing or isn't settled or doesn't feel happy, that will have a bigger influence than if you're a large organization. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, there are benefits regardless. You know, you yeah, can live no, no, it totally, totally agree, totally agree. And yeah. just, I'll, I'll ask one other question. Um, so having grown up as a child in the 60s and 70s in Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. where we were not a diverse or, you know, region yeah. at all, um, I think education, about diversity is mm -hmm. absolutely key. And certainly from the likes of Diageo, we, we put in lots of different training courses. So unconscious yeah. bias, um, you know, sort of inclusive leadership workshops, et cetera, just to try to educate people. And I think particularly in Northern Ireland, you know, my, my mother who's 87 comes out with some real clangers. My um, nanny's the same, we just hear some of them. You know, on diverse um, sort of thinking. Um, what do you, does your organization offer anything like that at all? In terms well, we don't of offer training as such, but we signpost to organizations that do it. You know, we don't okay. train. The support we give is really the fact of the, the, the getting people together to share ideas. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, for example, I mean, I, I agree with you. It's the education piece. People don't really get it or understand it. And that's nobody's fault. I mean, if I look back to whenever I was in Ag News, for mm -hmm. example, I didn't really, it wasn't on my radar at all, diversity and inclusion. I was just living my life. It wasn't until this, this position came up that I was like, what's it all about? What's diversity and inclusion about? I was Googling it, you know, yeah. um, and I'm very much in the space now and understand it, but it's, it's you, you, people think it's just, oh, it's just tokenism or it's just a tick box yeah. or oh, roll their eyes. They don't really get the, the vast benefits of it yeah. being really the smart thing to do. So, yeah. and then in relation to education, young people as well, you know, I'm a member of the, the Matrix Women in STEM, for example, steering committee, and there's a lot of work around schools yeah. and yeah. changing mindsets with young people and parents yeah. and teachers as well yeah. around it all, you know, so so it's it's more around, it's not that we train, we're not a training organisation, we're the award and authority, and it's yeah. all about the support yeah. and connecting people with others. Yeah. Um, we've organisations like, um, there's an event next week that all state are running, but they've, they've, they're doing it along with 
think five other organizations on board with us and we connect with them to work on things wow. together and they're they're using this event for their workforces to get them all together and talk about common um challenges and, and, and ideas so it's more the collaboration and the connections and we can introduce you to people for yeah. the likes of training but we don't do the training yeah. ourselves okay brilliant thanks That's christine awesome. Good question there. And you can tell who's been doing the homeschooling because uh, Esther has her hand up. <laughs> Let me spotlight. Yeah, just spotlight. There you go, Esther. Your turn with the question. Hi, uh, Christine. Thanks very much. Um, I'll lower my hand now. Um, yes. So in 2020, the whole homeschooling and, um, you know, everything fell more on the female, the mother in the house. And uh, they've said that it set us back lots with the whole workplace um especially workplace diversity you know so because they're sort of saying you know it's, it's mm. proved that women can't have it all because you can't work from home and homeschool and run the house and 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 you know so um how can we recover from this well there are there are silver linings and there are also obviously setbacks i believe from what has happened over the last year um, and i you know it has been women are quite naturally the caregivers and want to do the a lot of the caregiving and when they've had careers quite often they've suffered and there has been big setbacks in relation to females the silver lining i suppose is the fact that we've now discovered new ways of working um in relation to the flexibility and the trust as well that employers can have with employees um but it's it's about you know for me it's about looking at the journey um it's about women have quite often tried to succeed by being like more masculine um, and a lot of the role models that we see are you know their their family life suffers and they have to choose between do I want a career at the top of my sector and if I do I'm going to have to make sacrifices here so it's about it's very much about a journey um, the organizations that are really good at this actually have for example senior roles um, advertised as part-time you don't have to physically do the job and wear a burnout badge to be at that top level so it's about thinking differently. Um, like for example, Zurich, they um, recently, uh, they wanted more diversity at the top of their organization. They wanted more females because they realized it would improve their business. Um, but they just couldn't get women to apply because they didn't, women don't, visit, women feel like they have to make a choice. And quite often if they have a family, they choose their family, which is the right thing to do because um, they feel that they have to make a sacrifice. But Zurich, um, they changed the way of working and thinking and they advertised all senior positions as part-time flexible for men and women, obviously. Um, and they saw a 20% uplift in, in applications for women for those senior roles. And they're actually moving the dial now. So it's thinking differently about the culture that is at the top. Um, do workers in the organization wear their burnout badge with honor? I used to do that years ago. Um, and I would have snuck out, if I was leaving half an hour late, I would have snuck out the back door so nobody would see me. Even though I'd been in from eight o'clock and it was half five and I had a wee, wee baby at home, you know, you, you sort of felt like you're that guilt if you left before everybody else. So it's thinking differently about how leaders can actually lead by example here um, and leave early and make don't, don't hide it. You know, um, So I probably went off on a bit of a tangent there, but um, organisations are thinking differently about this now, definitely. And they realise they have to they have to shift culture and they have to change um, and they, they won't get that diversity, especially working families. Um, and women, um, unless they actually have a different culture in, in the, the roles that are generally perceived as high pressure, you know, you're always available, you answer emails at weekend and evenings and all of that, have to get try and move away from that. Um, and that will help retain people as well. Hopefully that's answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Good stuff. Thanks for that, Esther. My question, I've got one question, just a simple question. What time do you clock off from work these days now? <laughs> hey, me? Yes. <laughs> Me, well, I work four days a week. So I work. Um, Perfect. I work. Well, I've been working from home during the pandemic, but before that, I did work flexibly as well. So, yeah, I, I run my wee boy to school and I'm generally at my laptop for about two minutes past nine. Um, and then I just I finish. I mean, I'm finished at five o'clock at the latest. <laughs> good, yeah, good. Five o'clock. Five o'clock is my well, time was... for finishing and four days a week. There's John has a question. John, a spotlight. Yeah. Here. Hi, Christine. Uh, Hi, John. Um, Thank you. A big believer in, in what you're uh, doing. I've worked for some big companies, but I work a lot with some small companies now, particularly engineering companies yes. in Mid-Ulster, you know, Arma, uh, Banbridge, big engineering areas. Mm -hmm. 
Um, obviously, as you say, probably not such a diverse area, but they're really yeah. struggling for people. And so people like Martin McVicker of Combilift and Monaghan and some of the key employers are out there actually targeting specifically uh, girls' schools to try yeah. and get yeah. the diversity model going. So two quick questions for you. What? Um, what, what do you see if you were talking to people in that sector in particular, and sometimes they can be traditional people, what, what do you see as, I guess, maybe the biggest objection that they might have? And would you have an example of a company that, um, I suppose, starlights that that uh, diversity and inclusion and, and how it's maybe the example that it's, it's, it's had for them in terms yeah, of impact? Yeah. We have, uh, the 90 organizations we have on board 40 are in the STEM sector, so the science, technology, engineering, manufacturing sector. Um, so we do have quite a few sort of engineering firms on board and manufacturing firms, as well as look, we've got quite a lot of IT companies. Um, the biggest challenge is the funnel, getting the, the, the pipeline of talent because um, they advertise and it's all men that apply, you know, so it's very hard for them to move the dial when it's just their, their pipeline is all men. Because if you look at back to school, the, the amount of um, females that actually pursue a career um, go to, to college and, and, and pursue a career in STEM to the point of employment is just 7.8%. Um, and that figure is not changed much in 10 years. So that's why I'm involved in this Women in STEM steering group to try and actually think differently about this. So it's very much the talent pipeline. So those organizations that are very innovative are actually working, as you said, with schools. They're doing sponsored prizes. They're getting um, like business in the community, for example, have um, uh, an opportunity to connect with schools for three, a time to read and time to code initiatives. Um, and it's the, for example, if they have the, the few females they have, they really use them as role models to go back, to, even go back to their own schools and tell their story and, and share their yes. journey. Um, yes. And it's thinking about thinking differently about culture audits within the organisation. If, if a young female, like a, an apprentice, came in, what would she feel? What would be her feeling? Would she want to stay there? So um, one organisation actually did bring your daughter to work day before the pandemic, and it was to get a group of young people, youth teenagers together to really be honest about what it would be like to work there. And they had an action plan from that um, in relation to making it more sort of gender neutral, female friendly for young people coming in so that girls and boys would feel that they could thrive. NIE um, have some great examples on their website. They're one of our organizations. They've had a good success in getting female apprentices in and they showcase their journey on their website and use their stories. And they tell their stories about where they came from, the young girls, um, and, and what made them join the organisation and what it's been like for them. So if you check out their website, there's some good examples there. Good on you. Good on you. Love that bring your daughter idea. Isn't yeah. it good? Yeah, if, you, if yeah. you've done that now since, since one done it, we pass it on. And then if you have done it, um, it's been a bit more virtual. And then virtual virtual tours as well have been quite good recently in the, in the, in the COVID world. You know, some of these organisations have amazing workplaces. Maybe they've spent a lot of money. So we actually get people excited. If, if, for example, if I looked on a website of a company, I'll not spend long if I was an, a potential employee for the future. If I go to the careers page, would I feel excited? Um, some organizations, you wouldn't really feel excited if you looked. And others, you would think, gosh, I want to work there. So it's about thinking about your outward, how it looks to, to, to people. If they just spent maybe 20 seconds having a quick look on your website, what would they feel? And would they want to work in the organization? Good thinking. Good on you. Thank you. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks very much, Christine, for that very enlightening talk. Really enjoyed that talk. And thanks very much to everyone who asked the questions. If you want to join this network, then please do connect with us. Uh, details are in the description section of this YouTube video below. And I hope to see you at the next meeting. We meet up that the last Thursday of every month. And I'm looking forward to talking with you soon. Bye.